Is this video a ploy for me to get my friends to visit my YouTube channel? Perhaps. I'm just kidding. Um, I wanted to make this video because last week, um, the 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Caleth O. Caleth O. Wright, I think that's his middle name, right? Um, he came over and did an all call because he was actually the guest speaker for the Front Range Heritage Ball. Um, it's not actually the Air Force Ball because we do have Air Force and Space Force personnel, so it's kind of all inclusive and all that stuff like that. So, um, I did attend his all call and I recorded all one hour plus of his um, Q&A session because I feel that most of the stuff that he talks about is really important and these are the things that I also think about as well as being a leader. So, if you didn't get to um, see that in the flesh, then here you go. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. I didn't want to take up that much time. Bye! What a fantastic day to be an airman or a guardian on the front range. Mm -hmm. That's right. What else we got going on today? Air Force Ball. Thank you. So, uh, look, not only do we have amazing views, we've got amazing weather right now. Uh, we've got the Air Force Ball tonight, which is going to be a fantastic event. So thank you for all those who purchased tickets and are uh, planning on coming out. Uh, we have the opportunity, our speaker for tonight at the Air Force Ball, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force number 18, mm -hmm. retired. Uh, Caleb Wright is going to be our speaker, but he offered to do this session with us right here. And I think this was probably the best venue where we could have a little bit of an intimate environment. You guys can ask some really great questions uh, and see what the Chief's got in store for us. So without further ado, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, number 18, retired, Chief Caleb. This is supposed to be like uh, Oprah or something like that, right? So very <laughs> informal and I guess we're going to talk a little bit and then I'd love to hear from you guys. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask some questions and then in between that, you guys will have an opportunity to stand up and ask a question. Uh, I have somebody with a mic, so please just make sure to stand up. All right, first one. Actually, my feet don't even touch the ground. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, come on. I'm sorry. A couple of rules of engagement. So no questions are off limits. You know, softballs, fastballs, you know, I, I like the, the good stuff. I'll give you my opinion. And, and if I don't uh, feel like I can or want to answer it, I'll, I'll tell you that too. And I go by K right these days. Mm -hmm. So not Chief, not Chief Master of the Air Force. So if you want your question answered, <laughs> K right. <laughs> All right. So good morning, K right. <laughs> Can you share some memorable experiences or challenges you faced during your career that had a lasting impact on you? Ooh, so memorable uh, challenges in my career. I, I had a few, but probably the most impactful one was I was a, a senior master sergeant. I was stationed at Pope Air Force Base in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And um, man, I was a shit. Right, so at least I thought I was. I, I was like cooking on all cylinders. I was every award, every accolade, everything I was gonna make chief at about 17 years. And I had a chief that I didn't necessarily get along with. Uh, you know, she was a she was a good chief, but her and I didn't see, see eye to eye. She tried to give me some uh, advice, guidance, counseling one time. Uh, I was I was being pretty tough on, on one of my NCOs, probably un, unfairly tough, and she was trying to help help me out. And I just cursed her out, right? Like I, I literally said these words to her: "I reject this counseling. Don't tell me how to do my my effing job, right?" And uh, and she said, "Okay, I, I, I got it." And from that point forward, um, you know, I PCS. I didn't get a decoration. I didn't get a stratification. I, you know, uh, it sent me back about three years. So it took me three additional years to. To, to make chief, but it was probably the most, the three most impactful years of my entire career because, uh, as you can tell from you know what I was saying, I was I was probably more cocky and arrogant than, than than confident. I didn't understand the importance of relationships, especially you know managing relationships are easy with people you like, right? You're like I'm great at relationships, like yeah, because I, I like everybody, 
Uh, but it's more challenging with people you don't like, you don't see eye to eye, you don't get along with. So it gave me three years to mature as a person. Um, I, I became a better human being. I became a, a better man. I became a better teammate. And uh, so that was a that was a huge impact on my career. I, the, what I realized is I wasn't ready to make chief at 17 years. You know, I just wasn't mature enough. And so I'm glad I didn't make it. Uh, now, when I was in those three years, I wasn't sitting around on the stage saying, I'm glad I getting this lesson. I'm glad I didn't make it. You know, I was mad like everybody else, but I was blaming the world. I, you know, followed IG complaints and all that type of stuff. But, um, you know, another part of that story was <clears throat> I was in Korea when, after I left Pope, when I was, you know, struggling with the, this challenge. And um, once I realized that, man, I'm probably not gonna make chief, at least I thought I wasn't, I went to TAPS. So I had 17 years and I was sitting in TAPS. I, I was in, anybody been to Korea? So I went to Mr. Kim, I got me a two suits made and I was, <laughs> and I was fly, right? I'm like, I don't know where I'm going at 17 years, but I'm, I'm getting out. And uh, I actually went to work and started telling people like, hey man, you know, you're gonna have to find a new mentor because I'm, I'm getting out. And I had a uh, A1C, uh, Damon Stokes. He worked for me in the, in the dental clinic. And no no warm up, no nothing. He just walked into my office one day and said, hey, hey Sarge, I think you're a hypocrite. And uh, you know, first I told him to get the hell out of my office. <laughs> and then I realized, yeah, this, this dude was right, man. So I credit him for, you know, um, I was, I guess, speaking truth to power and allowing me to see that you know I wasn't living up to all the stuff that I was I was preaching. So that that, that was that was uh, challenging, but uh, very meaningful part of my career. Thank you. All right, so I'll open it up. Thank you. One question. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you were a Pops up first. Good morning, sir. My name is Master Sergeant Dakate from the Tenth Space Wing, and my question for you is: Do you think it's a must for is it must to have an overseen assignment to climb the leadership ladder? Because I have seen a pattern in most of the command chiefs and the chief master sergeant Miles that I have read that I have read and wanted to know was this the untold blueprint for these positions? I ask because I am active duty under the reserve component and there's not a lot of overseen assignments to pick from. No. So I, I don't think there's any real blueprint, right? If you look at you might find uh, similarities in the bios of Chiefs, you know, people who, who make it to the top. But I, honestly, I don't think there's any real blueprint. Who would have guessed that uh, myself, a dental, a dental tech, who spent almost all my career overseas, would have had a chance to be the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, right? I don't think anybody could have drew up that, that, that blueprint. And so um, some people get a chance to serve overseas. Some people get a chance to deploy. Some people don't. Some people get a chance to do special duties. Uh, some people don't. When I was in my in my last years, I know any maintainers here. Um, so uh, DK Kim, who was a career field manager for uh, maintenance, he stopped all um, maintainers from doing any special special duty because there was such a, a shortage in in the maintenance career field. So should we punish them for something like that? Uh, I, I would say no. So I don't I don't think you have to follow. I, if I was sitting on a promotion board or if I was evaluating whether you should be in some position, whether you had an overseas assignment or not would, would not be relevant, at least in, in, in my eyes. Now, how promotion boards might, might look at it. Um, because you can, there's other ways you can gain breadth and depth of experience other than you know, serving in a, in a particular place. So uh, if you get a chance, do it. Uh, Cause it's just kind of fun, especially to go to Europe. Um, but if not, I think you still have the same opportunity as anybody else. Thank you, sir. I do have two more questions, but I'll wait till the round. <laughs> I was very excited today, so I am going to ask the questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, along those same lines, um, the question that I have here is you provided leadership and guidance to countless airmen. What leadership principles or lessons do you believe are most important for success in the military? <laughs> The leadership lesson that I think uh, is most important to be successful in life, um, which would en encompass obviously the military, I think is adaptability, right? I think as, as a leader, you have to be learn to be adaptable because things change. The military is an organization, it's kind of funny, right? So Colonel Glisson, you know, old teammate of mine, 
Uh, we worked uh, for Jerome Goldfein at the same time and traveled the world and solved all kinds of issues and mm -hmm. had a lot of parties and stuff like that too. But, um, <laughs> You know, it, it, you know, she just got here four months ago. She has two years to make her mark on this organization, and then you'll get another commander. And the chief was here a little earlier than that, Chief Boom, and two years, maybe, because we don't always hold to our timelines. And, and he'll be gone, and you'll get a, a, another leader. So you have to learn to be adaptable uh, to different things. You got to learn to pivot. You got to learn to... Um, I, you know, I understand uh, heritage and history and tradition and all that type of stuff, man, but the, the world changes, you know, pretty, pretty rapidly. And so I think the best leaders, the best, and most successful people are good at adapting to, to, to new things. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be wishy-washy, right? But you do have to, if the environment changes, if the conditions change, if you get a new boss who says, yep, this was great, but we're going in a different direction, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to sit around like, man, we put all this work into this and, you know, I like this or we should go this way. Sometimes you just got to say, yep, yeah, got it, got it, coach. Um, what, are, what are the new marching orders? And let's figure out how to go. And, and also sometimes, you know, you got to be able to say, you know, I hear what you're saying, boss, and I know you just got here, but would you consider this, you know, not changing this program because the time, effort, energy, money that we, we put into it. So uh, I wasn't always like, like that, but I'm, I'm, I've learned over the years to be pretty adaptable uh, these days. I think it's a great, a great skill to have. And, you know, maybe, maybe a close second and uh, maybe even first is, you know, being authentic. Right? You know, you got to be yourself. It doesn't mean if you're a jerk that you can't work on yourself, right? But, you know, you got to, people like people who are real, who can, who they can trust. Because you can't really fake it, because you know these people can tell when you when you fake it when you're trying to be something that you're not. If you're an orator and you love speaking and you love, then then do that. If you're an introvert, you're quiet, you like kind of just being in your space. You can do that and still be effective as 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 a leader. So I would I would say, you know, be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Don't don't try to. It's okay to emulate your life or career after people that you admire and respect, but but you also have to be you know honest with who you are. Um, you've spoken a lot about that balance, that work-life balance, and not to just give it, your, give it your all and then have nothing for yourself once you retire or transition, because at one point we're all going to take this uniform off. Um, how do you do that in the military? Because we hear a lot of people say that afterwards, looking back, how do we prep ourselves and our airmen to take care of those things in tandem or kind of hand-in-hand with being successful in the military? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-pronged answer, I think, but, you know, part of it as individuals, you have to learn to say no, right? You have to learn, especially when you get into your prime years, right? You're, you're a senior master sergeant, you know, I'm sure you're, you know, uh, uh, competitive to, to be a chief. And when you're in your prime years and you can see the next strike, you can see the next opportunity, you have a tendency to, when somebody asks, can you do something? Yep, I sure can. Hey, can you manage the, the discipline chief right? Yep, I sure can. Hey, can you do this? Yep, count me in. Hey, can you be the president of the top three? Yep, I sure will. Um, and so sometimes you gotta you gotta know your own limitations and you gotta be willing to say, you know, hey, I, I do wanna advance in my career, but I also wanna have a life and I wanna have a, a family and I wanna wake up every day and have good energy and be productive to the people that are or around me and so sometimes that means saying no and and I'll be honest right some that does come with sacrifice because leaders we don't like no we say we do we say hey speak truth to power just tell us if you can't do it and then you tell us and we're like yep I'm writing her off man <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I'm gonna move on to, to somebody else or now when it's time to do stratifications uh well Gibson you know, maybe, but, you know, she turned down this opportunity and I don't know if that's the type of chief that we want and you know, all this BS and stuff. So, you know, part of it is, you know, understanding, you know, your limitations and, and, and saying no and prioritizing your mental, physical, emotional well-being over career advancement and, and success. You know, life is, 
Now, it's hard to maybe hear this from somebody who made it all the way to, to the top of their listed you know, food chain, but you know, life is, there's more to life than your rank and the positions and, and whatnot, right? The people that you surround yourself with, your family, you know, how much is missing all of your children's or most of your children's soccer, football, dance recitals and all that type of stuff? How much is it really work, work to you? And um, the military is good. It's been good to me and, and good to a lot of people, but uh, there are other things out, outside of life. I say all that to say that it's hard. And, and you know, to your question, how do you do it? The only advice I will give you is you have to do it with intentionality and purpose. It's not just going to happen. You're not just going to find time to relax. You're not just going to find time to to take your spouse out on a date. You're not going to find time to you know um, enjoy life. You're going to have to make it. You're going to have to decide. Just like you put everything else on the calendar, you got to put on the calendar. Take my wife out on a date. You're going to have to put on the calendar. I'm going to my son's you know soccer or or football game. I, I didn't do a good job. Of, of that for a great majority of my my career because I was so you know I was so hungry I was so and I you know some of it was I bought into these expectations people were telling me you can be this you should be that and you know rah 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 you're you're the greatest and I'm like yeah I, I got to be there for the people and and I expected my my wife at the time to to understand I expected my kids to just like hey you don't understand I'm like the chosen one like I got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna get in there and wash the damn dishes. Take the trash out. <laughs> and you know, when you're in it, right? You're in it. You, you, sometimes you need a, a good partner, a good friend, a good wingman to say, "Hey, man, you need to take your ass home sometimes, buddy. Right? Why don't you skip out on this one? This is we 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 got this." Now, I've always been good about. Um, I, I don't work late now or I just never really never never did when 4 35 o'clock I'm out right because my brain shuts down about two anyway so you're already <laughs> in three hours of just smush to begin with but five o'clock so I'm not a stay at work till seven eight nine o'clock um, now if something happens and and I really need to be there then I, then I will but generally um, you, you know I'm, I'm uh, I don't stay at work you know, late late like that Oh, wow. Okay, y'all are late now. <laughs> there we go. Hey, sir. Sergeant Menthol. Uh, hey, right. My question is, I need your advice on finding kind of a common ground on brand new officers that join your team, trying to find a common ground with them when they're not very open to feedback, in a sense, and try to help them learn the flight. Hmm. So first, it doesn't really make sense the way that we do this. There's no other organization on the planet that would take a college graduate and put them in charge of a major part of any organization with the advice, well, go find a senior NCO and attach yourselves to them and miss everything they say, right? <laughs> kind of doesn't make sense, which is you know why we have some of, some of these, these these challenges. However, I've, I've seen both sides. I've seen officers who are stubborn and feel like, hey, I, I attended this prestigious institution and I've been crowned with, you know, being the, 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 the flight commander or whatever it is, and I know best. And all of my mentors told me that I better keep you guys in line. I better present myself as that I'm, I'm uh, capable and confident. And then, I, then I, I've met officers who say, hey, yeah, I, I, I don't got it, right? So help me. Um, if you happen to get one, it sounds like you got one of the former. Um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, you should always begin with yourself, right? You should always begin with, what can I do to improve this relationship? How am I approaching this lieutenant? And am I going to him or her with the, hey, this is what you need to do? Um, you should listen to me, don't do this, don't do that. Or am I going to them with, hey LT, I noticed that uh, you decided to do this. You know, what was behind that decision? 
you know, how do you think it would have worked out? And how do you think the rest of the airmen in the flight, you know, might, might see that? Um, hey, I'm just interested. I'm just trying to be helpful and make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page and, and, and whatnot. That's an easier way to break into and build trust than you need to do this or don't do this or, hey, I've been here longer than you. You know, you don't know. You're just a dumb lieutenant. Um, you know, same thing, dumb, you name it, dumb, airman, dumb, you know, whatever. Uh, sometimes, you know, questions can be very, very powerful and very, very helpful in building trust and helping people understand, hey, we're all on the same page. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, a teammate to you. Uh, you know, let, let, let me help you. So, I, you know, I, I would say and sometimes it's, you know, hey, LT, man, I, I love to, to sit down or walk down the block and grab a coffee and, and just, just chit chat. And, uh, you know, again, ask questions. How do you think things are going in the unit, right? You know, how, how are you feeling as a, as a leader? You know, what's, what's hard for you here? You know, what, what, do you, what do you struggle with? You know, how can I be of, of more help to you? Now, once you build a trust, then you can start Okay, let's not do this. Let's let's do that. But man, you know who who likes uh, being cheat? You just come off the top rope like, ah, oh, you need to do this. And don't do that. Yeah. Maybe try a different approach. If that doesn't work. Go find a cheat and just tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, right. Uh, Mass Sergeant Zerman, HQ Soft of Safety. Hindsight is 2020. when I mean, you look back. And so my question is kind of two part is if as you look back now, what you wish you would have accomplished, one of the biggest things you wish you would have accomplished or changed that would have impacted the future as we move into multi-capable airmen and everything else. And the second part is how we, because we're looking forward, can apply that to move in the right direction and kind of embrace that and move out. Man. <laughs> yeah. So I always have two answers for this, right? There's a part of me that doesn't believe in do-overs, right? My, my life turned out the way that it did. I'm happy about it. I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of things I wish I wouldn't have done. Um, but, you know, you don't get do-overs in life, right? So, you know, why waste time thinking about what could have been, should have been, whatnot? However, if I could do it over again, particularly my, my time as the Chief Master of the Air Force, I would have worked harder to get rid of the entire enlisted evaluation system, all of it. Wow. The baby, the bathwater, the bathtub, the bathroom, <laughs> the whole wing of the house, the house, the neighborhood. Like, I just don't see any way that it, we can make it make sense. We we had screwed it up so much, and 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 I've you know had some experience with other performance management systems. Um, that tells me there's a much better way, um, but but we can't fix what we got. We just got to throw it all. Away. So I wish I would have, you know, I, I don't comment on Air Force stuff that often, but I saw a recent post about some testing, electronic testing or something. And I was like, testing, I'm like, damn, that's what that's what they're going on. <laughs> um, I would have spent more time in the uh, suicide resilience space, even though, you know, it was one of my priorities, I would have focused, I would have been, I think, somewhat hyper-focused in that, because I think it's important. I did some work, you know, for the DOD after I retired in that in that space. I would have worked harder on issues for women, not not just, you know, hair and, and uh, you know, I, I think Joe and, and her team are, are doing great, but, you know, there's some real kind of issues. You don't see a lot of female wing commanders in the, in, in the Air Force. I would have done more work on race issues, right? I'm sure you went to the Wing Commanders, you know, conference, and you could probably count the number of, you know, African American Wing Commanders on one, one maybe half a hand. So, so there's still, I think, a lot of work to be to be done in some of those people areas. But, but what happened? So, what I would tell you, the advice, the second part of your question is, anytime you get into a leadership position, you're going to get peppered with things with issues, with concerns, with, you know, and a lot of them they are, because you know, you may remember when I first started, my philosophy was, I'm just gonna try to hit as many singles, you know, General Goldfinn and I said, let's just, you know, let's, and we don't need to try to knock it out of the park. Let's just, you know, hit a bunch of singles and see if we can win the game, right? Let's change the EPRs, get rid of course 14, course 15, you know, men you can wear earrings, blah, blah. you know, we just like a lot of, a lot of little things that 
you know, we felt like we're making a difference, but sometimes that detracts you from the big things. And you, you can do it all, but the reality is, so I would say going forward for you as leaders, you know, when you get into leadership positions, don't try to do everything. Find the two to three, maybe three to five most impactful things that you think you can get across the finish line that will make a difference and like be dogged about working on, on those. Right. Some of the some of the things, you know, the little things you can either delegate or, you know, you can say, OK, if it's kind of like how you how you should do your schedule every day. You, know, you should wake up every day and you've probably seen the put the big rocks in first thing, right? You, you mm -hmm. put the big rocks in the jar and then you have room for all the other little stuff. You should you should schedule your day around, hey, I got like three really important things I need to get done today. So I'll put those on the calendar first. And if I have time to go chip and putt and hit golf balls, if I have time to go sit at the cigar bar, you know, whatever else other priorities you have, <clears throat> then 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 I'll I'll get to that. So you know, I kind of wish I would have been a little bit better. I thought my system was good because I was tackling the issues. I was coming out, speaking to you guys um, in person, on social media. I was getting all this feedback. Hey, change this, let's fix that. And I was like, yep, got it. We can we can fix this. Um, but I, but I, honestly, I was probably neglecting some of those bigger issues that required more time, you know, effort and attention. So. Yeah, I was, I was kind of disappointed that it took us any defenders in here, any female defenders in particular? Right? We took us forever. I don't know if you have body armor that's suited for you. Now I want to put you or your leadership on the spot, right? But, <laughs> like, you know, for years, female defenders just wore whatever the men wore, like, as if our anatomies are, are the same. I don't know if we have any female aviators. For years, uh, there was no um, ability, you know, for them to use the bathroom in, in flight suits, like, like just whatever the men wear. I think women still wear men's boots and whatever. You know, we just kind of take it for 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 granted. So, um, and that you know that, that doesn't that doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense to, to to be honest. I mean, we we're the greatest Air Force on the planet. We we should just do better sometimes. Morning. I am. I'm Sergeant Wright from the Vice First Network Operations Squadron. Uh, my question is, what is an opportunity that you were skeptical of and then you were glad that you took at the end of it? Be the Chief Master of the Air Force. <laughs> That's a good one. Hey man, I'm gonna tell you something. When, because, raise your hand if you knew who I was before I came to Chief Master of the Air Force. Before. <laughs> Right, so I kind of came from the shadows, right? And so when when um, somebody told me my name was going to be on the list to compete, I was like, "Yeah, this is just a Rooney Rule, man. They just need to put a black dude up there to say." <laughs> right. And I ain't like, I ain't, man, I ain't trying to go through all that. Waste all this time in this uniform job. I know I'm not. I'm not going to get it. Right, General Goldfin had never met me. Maybe we had maybe met once, right? Briefly, I'm like. You know, all indications are that this particular guy is going to be it. You know, everybody, everybody, you know, talking about this or, or that. So I was like, man, I do not want to waste my time, you know, doing this. And then just maybe it took me about three or four days and then something just clicked and said, you know what? I put you in the game, take a shot. I put you in the game, take a shot. Like, he going to have to work his ass off not to choose you. That's like what I told myself. Right? And that was still, you know, I still had a little bit of that cocky. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, I got a call from his secretary at the time, during Goldfin secretary, saying, hey, he wants you to come to D.C. and interview for the job. I was at a hotel somewhere in D.C. the morning before the interview because we, you know, we had him and wife, we went and we had breakfast with him and, and Miss Dawn. Mm -hmm. And then... <clears throat> Miss Dawn and my wife went off and did something else, and, and he and I went and did the interview. And uh, but before I left the hotel, you know, I keep a little journal every day, and at the top, you know, I wrote at the top, "I'm about to be the mother scrubbing chief <laughs> master." Like, like I'm just gonna speak it into existence. Did the interview; it was great. You know, we had a good, good talk. We were talking just like old friends, and. Um, 
And then I, I left, I went back to the hotel, I told my wife, man, pack your stuff, man, we're going to DC. And she said, he told you already? I'm like, nope, but I'm telling you, I can feel it, like it's about to happen. So I was very skeptical at, at first, and then, uh, you know, things, things worked out pretty, pretty good. So. Hi, sir. Uh, Texas. Ask it, man. Tech Sergeant Parker, uh, Mr. Tech Therapy Basin CAG. Um, my question for you is, you came and visited us a few years ago, and you said, uh, which I have it written on a sticky on my computer, um, put your mask on first. And so in line with uh, Senior Gibson's questions, um, how can we kind of instill that into our airmen um, for those individuals that just want to come to work every day, do their job, and go home, or for those individuals that want to fight for the strats and push themselves into their careers, um, or even get out, go into the reserves? Like, how can we make sure, one, we're putting our masks on first, as well as making sure our airmen are doing the same thing? Yeah, so I think, you know, going back to my original statement, you have to be intentional and purposeful about, you know, how many of you block time on your calendar for fitness? That's not unit PT. Like, actually, if you pulled up your calendar app or whatever you use right now, you would have time blocked for fitness? How many of you have time blocked for prayer or meditation? How many of you have time blocked besides um, Ty back there for food prep, right? Because she, she preps food for a living, right? I mean, how, so that's what I'm saying. You can, you, can, you can talk about it or you can actually be intentional and say, I'm going to eat better, so let me make time to go shopping and prep food for the week or, you know, cook or, you know, whatever whatever you need to do. Like my mental well-being is important to me, so let me make time to get up in the morning and pray or meditate or, or what have you. And so I, I think, you know, one, being a good example, um, how many of you have, um, what do you call the excess lead? I never had it. Um, <laughs> how many of you have use or lose lead? Raise your hand if you got use or lose. Right. I suspect there's more of you just don't want to raise your hand when we're talking about it. But, you know, There's some to me, setting a good example <laughs> by saying, you know what, my kid has a major recital I'm taking the afternoon off. Um, also setting a good example by saying, I know your kid has a major recital, why don't you take the afternoon off? I'll pick up the slack, I'll get on the console or stay at the gate or, you know, what, whatever it is. Like, intentionality, I think, is key. Um, and then educating people about, like, I, I never, you know, I, Thought I was relatively smart, but you know I never realized the impact of not getting good sleep had on on my performance, mm. right? Until I started reading and listening to podcasts and kind of researching like the importance of, of sleep and the difference between good sleep and you know all this all this other stuff, right? And same thing with eating and you know whatever it is that you think you know whatever putting your mask on first means to you. Educate yourself. Educate your people. You know, be a good example, and and then you know, from a leadership standpoint, you know, make sure people take their lead. Make sure people take time off when there's nothing happening, and you know there's about to be a surge. Like you know, Corona is coming, and it's going to be a madhouse. You have generals and people running all around, going crazy. Like so, give people some time off this this week, or schedule some time off for them the week after you know Corona Corona ends. And, so I, so I just think, you know, that intentionality and purposefulness is, is, is really important. You know, invest in yourself, right? I'm not promoting, you know, Ty's, Ty's business, you know, but if you can spend money at Burger King and Cheesecake Factory, you could probably afford to, to hire a, a chef or somebody that could do meal prep for you to guarantee that you eat, you and your family eat much better, right? Which will in turn help you feel better and, you know, all, all, this, all this other stuff. So. Um, but I think, again, it goes back to that saying, if you don't remember one word, it's intentionality, right, about, about that. Good morning, Kay Wright. Mass Sergeant Rose, USOF MTISL. So a few years back, I met you at Ramstein Non-Commissioned Officer Academy, and I asked you about what your opinion was for the biggest threat to our Air Force. Um, other than the obvious threats that we're currently facing right now with uh, going on in Israel, Korea, and all those things, what do you think our current threat is right now that our Air Force and Space Force is threatening? 
Yeah, so I, I think the biggest threat might be, you know, I, I never really honestly, uh, you spend enough time in the Air Force, you spend enough time in skiffs and in vet briefings and understanding the capabilities of the Air Force. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't worry too much about a lot of external threats, just, just to be perfectly honest. You know, I feel confident about the Air Force and the Joint Forces ability to defend in just about any, especially, you know, once I started learning about, you know, space and capabilities we have. I think the biggest threat might be an internal threat, right? Is Air Force, the military in general, man, is just too slow. It, it, it's, it's, it adapts too slow to life, right? It took us way too long to allow tattoos. It took us way too long. You know, right now we're struggling with the whole beard thing. I did a 180 on beards myself, right? I think we should allow every man in the Air Force to wear a beard. Um, <laughs> I mean, I spent, I was the USAFE of Africa Command Chief, and before that I was the third, third Air Force Command Chief. So I spent a lot of time with my NATO counterparts. They all had beers, and I mean like Viking beers, not just, you know, scrub. Mm -hmm. And I, I never once looked at them as being unprofessional mm -hmm. or thought like, oh, these guys are going to get on the gas mask. Like, you know, <laughs> But you know, life life happens, man. The world is evolving, and the Air Force sometimes is is a bit too slow for me. Uh, Technology-wise, right, that's going to be a huge threat, I think, to the Air Force. Is uh, I started hearing about uh, what is this? Uh, the no, I love ChatGPT. <laughs> no, no, no. This new system, the pay in admin personnel system. Oh, AFIPS. AFIPS, right. Man, I started been hearing about that like 15 years yeah. ago. And I, do you have it now? <laughs> no. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was working for Air Force Aid Society. I showed up and thought, this makes no sense. Our IT system is outdated and, and whatever. And three months later, we were starting a new one, right? And and, and we got a whole new IT infrastructure. So so I, so I think, you know, some of the, the threats are right right in, in front of us if, if we don't learn to adapt. It, it, I think it's already starting to impact recruiting. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't adapt to the way that we see things, if we don't adapt to how how um, some of you are in the room, most of you are probably millennials and, and some of you are Gen Zers, right? How they think and how they, how, how they see the world very you know, short term. Mm -hmm. like, you know, I think Gen Zers don't look at careers in terms of 20 years. Like, you want me to commit to something for 20 years and do the same damn thing? Like, no. I want to try this and I want to try that. If it don't work, I, I might I might try this. And we have to be accepting of that because that's mm -hmm. how people, young people think mm -hmm. these, these days. And, uh, so yeah, I think, you know, the, the real threats from my perspective are, are, are a bit internal. Sometimes our traditions and systems and this is just the way that we do it, like, Know, you guys are probably finding it difficult to say K right now. <laughs> right. Not in the Air Force anymore. It's my name. I heard you say you didn't want to ask it, so it must be a good one. Last time I was with the 561st Network Operations Squadron. K right. Question. Well, I had two things. One, I was originally going to ask. I wanted to ask a controversial one. I'll do that later. Um, <laughs> transitioning. You were in the military for so long. How was the transition to go to the civilian sector, and what was the biggest hurdle on like learning? Hey, this is not me. I'm not in the military anymore. I want to be civilian. Kid, right? Um. So it was a very, very smooth transition, and I personally didn't have any hurdles. Now, a caveat that with I was the chief master of the Air Force, right? I had a job as a CEO of Air Force Aid Society six months before I transitioned. So my transition was relatively easy. Um, I did my VA stuff before I got out. You know, I had other job offers. Um, I never really had any is issues with, you know, carrying my rank into my personal life and, and all that, that good stuff. So, you know, for me, and I, and, I, and I don't believe I'm speaking for the majority of people in that, that retired, retired chiefs and colonels, generals and, and whatnot. But but just to be perfectly honest, my transition was relatively easy. I, I never really kind of felt like, I never walked outside and was like, oh, where's my hat? Like, oh, I don't have a hat. You know, just like, 
I, I don't know where any of my uniforms are. I sent a couple of them to some museums. Um, <laughs> you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm done, right? Uh, it's, it, was a, it was an easy transition, easy transition for me. I think most people probably struggle a little bit with, uh, you know, especially the higher up you are, where you go from being somebody and everybody respects you just, you know, maybe they respect you because of who you are, but a lot of people respect you because of your rank. And then you get out and you're just like a citizen. And, you know, there's no cheap parking spots. There's no <laughs> cut in line at the bank because you're a cheap. Nobody's going to come grab you from the back and be like, all right, we'll take care of this, this for you. Um, if you're not careful and don't manage your TSA stuff, you'll be down and getting rubbed on. Because <laughs> that, that was the one thing. I, I didn't know that my TSA, my DOD ID number no longer worked for Preaching, right? <laughs> so I'm at Dulles, you know, down at the basement getting felt up and like, I didn't like, <laughs> have no exec anymore. I have nobody to call. I'm just like, you got to suck it up. And <laughs> sit in this middle seat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of your transition, I think, has to do with who, who you are while you're in. If your entire being is based on your rank, <laughs> then you're going to have a hard time transitioning when the rank disappears, right? If there's more to you than master sergeant, colonel, general, chief, you know, whatever you are, if there's more to you when you're in, then when you get out, you have all these other aspects of your life that you can fall back on and, and, and be a part of, and you have a whole group of friends and colleagues and, and whatnot. But if, but if all you are is, Master Sergeant, Colonel, General, Major, what have you, then when you transition, you typically have a, a pretty difficult time. Yeah. What's the second question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the bomb on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you talked about earlier, like you, you did a 180 on the, uh, the beard thing. Um, also, we talked a little bit about some of the other standards and some of the, the trans, the things for women and like uniform changes and stuff. What do you think about the idea of a standard across the board for all genders, regardless of male, female, whatever, whatever gender category you fall in? Example, women have hair standards changed because, you know, some health issues and headaches and stuff like that. But the hair standards for women don't prevent them from doing the same job as male and females. It's even across the board when it comes to the work portion. Why not be? Why not have standards across the board for male and females? Like when it comes to hair standards, regardless of beard, facial hair, anything like that, um, men should have the same standards as women because it doesn't prevent you from doing work. It becomes more of an image of what we want you to present. But over the course of years, we've seen that the military has slowly transitioned and allowed the influence from the civilian sector and how we kind of proceed and go forward with um, like the personality, the individuality, if you will. Um, not saying that everyone needs to be an individual and there has to be military standards. However, why not just make it across the board and what are the limitations that you see that will prevent that from happening? Let me answer the first part, of the, the, the last part of your question first. The limitations that will keep that from happening are old men that run air, oh, white men that run air. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, we're, if we're just being perfectly per frank. Mm -hmm. Now, how I feel, I, I work with professional, and let's stick to men for a second. I work with professional men um, that are extremely talented that um, I would work for any day, I would hire any day, I enjoy, have a great relationship with, and they have dreads, they have, you know, long hair and a beard in, in, in some cases. And, and again, it never crosses my mind to think like, wow, this guy is pretty unprofessional with these 
dreads and fears, right? I just look at them as a talented, talented individual. So if I had a vote, I would say, hey man, like if you if you're a guy and you want to have long hair or if you want to have dreads or flats or braids or, or whatever and be in the military, you know, fine, fine by me. Because again, I think we're getting to a point where you know that stuff will start to impact. You know, I have a son who has dreads, right? And he wanted to come in the Air Force, and you know why he decided not to? Yeah. Anyone cut his hair? <laughs> right, and there was one point he was like, he was in a bad place, right? And I'm like, hey man, like, I know people, right? I can find things. Went through all this stuff, and he was like, nah, man, I ain't coming here, right? Now, Air Force will be fine without my son. Uh, but, you know, do I ever see it happening? I don't. I don't think so. Maybe not in my lifetime. But do I think it? It's, it, it makes sense. Yeah. You know. Again, there there was a time when you know I didn't start shaving my head until I was. I started shaving my hair early. I was about 24, and not because I was losing my hair, but I was stationed in Korea. This guy was cutting my hair. He left. I tried to cut it myself. I messed it up like four times. A girl told me I was nice with bald head, and I just kept going. Far. <laughs> but in in the early nineties, this was Spanish. People would say to me, like, "You can't wear that. Like, you can't shave your head. This, this is a this is a fad." And so, you know, the evolution of standards it happens pretty, you know, pretty pretty slow. I, I remember when when we first authorized, you know, ponytail. There's people that just would have a fit, like, you know, hey man, it's just hair. It's just people. So, so to your point, you know, can we have a a standard? I don't. I won't say across the board, right? Because, like I mentioned earlier, there are some things that are anatomically different, physically different between men and women. Hair happens to not be, you know, one of them necessarily. So if, if if there was a standard that said, you know, for example, could you wear your hair in two ponytails or in dress or whatever, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't bother me. Um, but but again, you know, I've I've become a, a lot more progressive, I think, in, in in the way I think about some of this stuff and see these things and and I can you know, I think standards are important, don't get me wrong. I think it's important to have standards and, and hold people to certain standards. But I, but I think people's ability to perform what we ask them to do uh, is important too. And that should be in the forefront sometimes. We spend so much time. I remember, man, like, man, this stuff get on my nerves. I remember chasing y'all down about wearing a hat. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I, I think I changed letting men wear earrings on base, because I got tired of talking to dudes in the class six. You know, I'm in the class six trying to, Friday night, man, trying to get me a beer. And, and, some bourbon. I was probably drinking Hennessy back then, but <laughs> like, I talked to this dude about this earring. Like, man, I ain't trying to waste time with all this. Hey, Sarah, senior man Baylor from the Medical Support Squadron. So we talked about um, suicide awareness and mental health and everything. And I have some friends that were in different career fields that felt like they couldn't talk to mental health because of the career implications. Um, so from a junior enlisted standpoint, I want to know how do we continue to fight for that, for people to feel like they are able to go and talk about their problems without having the negative connotation of it, or being afraid of like what the repercussions are as far as their career advancement. How do we continue to fight for that? I think there's perception and then there's reality, right? And they're not a one or a zero, they're, they're kind of like this. The perception is still that there's a stigma around asking for help, around mental health, right? That is a perception. There's a reality that says a very, very, very small percentage of people who raise their hand and say, hey, I need help, lose their security clearance or anything negative happens to, to, to them. But there's also a reality that there are that small percentage of people that <laughs> raise their hand and get treated differently. They get taken off mission. They get they lose their security clearance and, and so on and so forth. And so the the perception and the reality kind of all fade in into each other. And and frankly, the that small reality 
feeds the big perception that it is not okay to ask for help. Even as much as senior leaders get up and say it, as much as senior leaders get up and say, you know what, I go see a chaplain every day. Or I, I see the psychologist, he's right there. You know, I, I go and talk to him. Yeah, but you're not me. And you don't work in this unit with all these grunts that are believing just to tough it out and, you know, and you, you can't cry around here and you can't whine around here without somebody, you know, calling you weak and all this other stuff. And so the implications aren't necessarily always losing a security clearance or, you know, being taken off mission. Sometimes it's just a ridicule that you have to put up with by being called weak and not being able to handle it and, hey, we don't trust you and, you know, all that, all that, all that good stuff. You know, this really has to start with leadership. It has to start with, you know, us leaders just, man, some, you know, we, we try to be, we can be complicated sometimes with do all these things. And sometimes it just boils down to be better, do better, be a better human being, right? Realize how challenging it is for, for people. Just because you had a rough life and you're tough and you deal with things a certain way doesn't mean that everybody, everybody else does. Um, learn, people have to learn to be more empathetic. And sometimes you have to educate people about your situation. You know, same as, as I was telling him, sometimes asking questions, you know, is good. Hey, yeah, I, I hear you saying that we should just tough this out, but you have any idea what I've been through in my life? You have any idea how hard it is to be the only black female in this in this unit? Mm -hmm. You have any idea, you know, what I struggle with on a on a daily basis? Do you mind if I tell you? Right, and sometimes that can soften that that our that hardcore that we have as military leaders sometimes because. You know, there's a lot of us that have. I, I used to be like that. I just suck it up, man. Life is hard. You know, it's hard for everybody. Just be tough, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bad, bad way to be. And so I think the combination of, you know, leaders being more empathetic, being more understanding, um, and listening more. That, that's something that we all struggle with as leaders, right? How many of you are good listeners? Basically, nobody in the room is saying <laughs> that's trouble for whoever you supervise, right? <laughs> and probably for your spouse or significant other, and your kids. And, you know, that's like an essential skill to her life and success is being being good listeners and being empathetic and 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 do this for me in life when it comes to this issue, mental health, mental well being, suicide, but any other issue. Man, be curious. Be more curious about people and more curious and ask more questions and try to gain better understanding. Stop judging and stop telling and stop giving advice. Like nobody wants or needs your advice all the time. Sometimes they just need somebody to listen. Sometimes, you know, you're better served asking a question than giving a statement. You should do this, you know. Um, as long as that you know, perception is is still there. It's it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for I think you know people, particularly young people like you mentioned, um, to deal with the the issues that they have from a mental health standpoint. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And and again, just like with what we were talking about earlier, sometimes you got to ask yourself: Do I, do I want to be a well person or do I want to have a good career? And they're not necessarily again a one or a zero. You can do both, but sometimes you got to sacrifice career stuff, mm -hmm. like, hey, I don't want to lose my clearance, but the stuff that I'm going through now, I probably need to not be on the console. I probably need to not have access to this information or be a part of this this team. So let me get myself right and then, you know, hope that I can get back in the game. Uh, because if you don't, then what we typically see is people get to a point where they burn out, they get to a point where they turn to drugs and alcohol and other ways of trying to cope with whatever demons or whatever issues they might be, might be having. Good morning. Um, CMI Sergeant Walt with Becker Point. Either through your direct experience or what you've seen throughout the Air Force, can you speak to how you've seen members receive back from units coming out of DSD? And secondly, what advice would you give to leadership that would that have members returning to their career fields from DSDs and how to leverage them? 
Uh, I think I've seen a mixed bag, right? I can't. I, I was a PME instructor, and man, you can tell me nothing, man. I went back to the dental clinic, and I had open ranks in space, and uh, <laughs> formation runs, and I was all ate up doing all kinds of stuff. There. Probably didn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, so I think you know, my advice is you got to have realistic expert expectations, right? Especially like, are you are you would it you like MTIs or yeah, yeah, yeah so. Requires a little bit of yelling and telling people what to do, where to go, or what to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of you know forceful kind of positions of power, authority. Like you get back to your unit, you know it don't work like that, right? You came from a unit, unless you were born with those rules, right? Yeah. You came from a unit, so you know you have to be, have some realistic expectations going back. That okay, this was a training environment, and this is how I operated. Not, everybody's not going to show up, you know, over here with pressed uniform and all squared away and haircuts and all this type of stuff. But this is more normal than what I just came from, right? So I have to accept and I have to do a little bit more work and I have to be more of a human being, you know, over here to deal with the reality of what's happening. And some people can't make the, they, they can't make the jump back, right? Because they're so accustomed to when I say jump, you jump when everything should be squared away in this order. This is how stuff is supposed to be. This is how the books are written and what's supposed to happen. And you know, the real world just doesn't operate like that. So I would just say, you know, give yourself some grace, give the people that you serve some grace and, and be realistic in what you might expect going back. This is kind of how I feel in general about special duties. And I, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I did a I did a special duty, but you know, honestly, they're not all that special. They're just duty, right? What what you do now is not that much special than the defender out here on the gate for twelve hours protecting this this installation. I know it's hard to hear, right? Again, I don't I don't want to like offend anybody who does it, right? Because I know it requires you know, time, effort, and energy, but man, so does being a missile maintainer. And so does a lot of the other jobs in the Air Force that are really, really hard. And and being an MTI or an MTL or a PME instructor, they have their own challenges, but, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not that much special or different than any other job in the, in the Air Force. And I think we made a mistake by by creating this special category and and, and saying, okay, you're, you're the best of the best. Yeah, some, in some instances you are, in some, most instances, you're the best of what was available, right? And in some instances, you're the person that I wanted to get rid of out of the unit. All right, so I put you in the list. <laughs> so maybe a little bit of kind of, you know, accepting the, the reality of, you know, we all should have some level of kind of humility when it comes to the jobs and the opportunities that, that we get. And, and then if you understand the assignment system, you know nothing is guaranteed. You're mm -hmm. gonna get with, with what's available. You know, you can do a DSD five, 10, 15 years, but where you go next is gonna be based on what's available, mm -hmm. right? What the system has available for you and your particular um, ca career field. So uh, now to that, what I will say, I've been the recipient of several folks who come back from being MTIs and, and, and other recruiters and other special duties. You know, what I would say to, to those individuals are, man, take advantage of the experience and the, and the, the, the capabilities that this, this person brings. I, I know as an MTI, you know, you were well-versed in this skill, that skill. So, hey, let me recognize that and utilize you correctly as, as you come back. Again, that, that, that does also come with some, but let me help you realize that you're back in a regular unit now and, this is kind of how stuff stuff works, but um, I think so on both ends. Some realistic expectation management. Plan. One last question. And then I'll get you in the back. I saw you stand up. I will. I'll do that. What is? And this is the last question I have on here. What is something that us as enlisted officers as well don't see out of the chief master sergeant of the Air Force? I think sometimes we have this perception that. It's all these meetings and meet and greets, and we're like, what about us? What, th what things are you guys doing for us? What are some things that we don't see where you guys are fighting for us or advocating on our behalf that we kind of maybe just don't appreciate? 
Um, well, there's a lot of meetings. And there's a lot of meeting greets. And, uh, that's that's a big big part of the job. Um, maybe what you don't see is, and I'll just speak from my perspective, right? I think I was probably a little bit different than some of my predecessors in using technology and social media and and whatnot to get feedback. You might not see all of the the times that I spend, like we did last night at dinner, the times that I spend on the phone or texting, you know, young people your age and, and younger talking through issues and trying to figure out, you know, what's the what what is it that you need? How can I best help? What what ideas do you have? Would you like to come to the Pentagon to help us, you know, um, fix this? But I don't think you necessarily have to see it. I think if, if as the Chief Master of the Air Force, you build up enough trust with some of the things that you're doing, I, I hope that people feel like, okay, k Rad is working on our, our behalf. We don't always see all the meetings. We don't always see all the results. But, you know, based on what he's done so far, I, I feel good about that, that he's, he's working on these things. I mean, man, look, leadership jobs are easy and they're hard. I, I, General Goldfield was my boss and there was never not one time he said you need to be here or do this or do that right so I just run around on my own just doing, I had so much autonomy and flexibility to go where I wanted and do what I wanted and work on what I what I wanted I, I made sure it aligned with his his priorities um, and so in that facet you know most chiefs and senior NCOs you, you know it's, 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 rel it's relatively easy but it's also hard, right? Trying to figure out what to work on, how to prioritize it, you know, how to be a good advocate for all of the people. Because one of the mistakes that I, I think a lot of leaders make is they, they this term fairness, right? We gotta treat everybody the same. I gotta give you the same opportunity that I gave everybody else. And that's a little bit tricky, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes what you don't what you really want is equity. Mm -hmm. And that means you require more attention than him. And so I'm gonna spend, but, and we frown upon having to give you more of my time than I have to give him, but that's how life works, right? If you got kids, if you got more than one kid, there's a pretty good chance that one of them requires more time and attention than mm -hmm. one or the other, even if they're twins, right? That's just how life, life, life works. And, you know, so sometimes it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging as a, as a leader, but, well, you know, for the most part, um, I, I think, you know, le leadership is, I, I would categorize it as easier than, than hard, if I'm, if I'm being totally honest, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's easy to be a leader, but, um, yeah. Hey, right. how you doing, sir? My man, how you doing? Pretty good. Uh, Staff Sergeant Green, 367 Recruiter Squadron. Not a recruiter, personnel is working the CSS. Uh, so one of the questions I, I have uh, for you is, during your tenure, especially as Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, uh, have you ever been faced with a decision, uh, I'll kind of give an example here, with uh, dealing with higher leadership, let's just say that, where you know you have oppositions or decisions that need to be made, they have one idea, but you know that, hey, my idea is probably better, uh, probably because it saves money, manpower and it's innovative but sometimes it's kind of hard to get that across the board when you have people that are a little bit higher than you making those decisions and you don't want to get your decisions good when you know it is um, do you have any i guess advice when it comes to trying to i guess make things better and not just in your career field but probably other people who are dealing with the same thing uh, when it comes to making decisions that could possibly improve unit and unit capability yeah so my first advice man is Get comfortable with taking L's, right? None of us like it, right? We always think we got a good idea, it's gonna save money, it's gonna be better for the world, and, and if we don't get our way, then we get, we start huffing and puffing and all this other stuff. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, that's just, you know, part of it. And you have to be okay. If you're okay with winning, you have to be okay with, with, with taking L's sometimes and figuring out what can I learn from it, how can I be a, a better person. But, to get to more wins, to deal with the people that you're talking about, you have to be good at data. You have to be good at making a strong case. You know, just showing up saying we should do this and 
you know, I wish we would do that. And, you know, I heard this or I'm reading this report and it says this, you know, that doesn't really cut the mustard. What, what most leaders can't really look away from is, hey, you know, I put together this six to 10 point slide presentation with, you know, the reason why we should transition from this system to that system. You know, here's the analysis, here's the resources, this is the references, this is where it came from, this is the most recent reporting. You know, here are the three options that would, would be better for us than, you know, what we currently have. I'll just leave that with you. You know, I'll come and see you again next Thursday and hopefully we can have a good discussion about it. Right? Now, you might have to fight through, did you read it yet? No, I didn't get a chance to read it. That's no problem, you know, take your time. I'll just put it back at the top of your inbox. And when you get to it, you know, you, you let me know, right? And you can kind of guilt a, a person into reading stuff and, and dealing with, okay, man, this is actually a, 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 a pretty good idea. But you know you know how leaders are, man, especially senior NCOs, you start coming in with all these new ideas, we start feeling what? What's the word? Threatened. Mm -hmm. Like, you just showed up here, man, how you going? I've been doing this for 20 years, you gonna tell me how to do my job? Actually, yeah, I am, because what we're doing don't make no damn sense. <laughs> but I'd much rather show you with analysis and data and science, you know, whatever it is that's backed up with references, you know, here's, here's you know, um, Colonel Glisson's take on it. Here's all the supporters take on it, but here's all the naysayers, you know, here's also the risk that, in, that are involved with going to 12 hour shifts or you know, whatever it is. And here's how I think we can mitigate, you know, all, all of that risk. Most times we don't want to do all that work, right? Especially if we think it might not end in the decision that we want. But you know, there's, there's advantages to going through all that, right? You learn, you grow. Sometimes you go through and you do all that research and you realize, yeah, I thought this was a good idea. It's probably actually really not. The data says that it, it doesn't make sense to go to this system or you know, go from 10 to 12 hour shifts or you know what, what have you. But to me, that's the best approach. If somebody comes to me, now I've been around long enough that if you came to me and said, hey, Carrie, I got a good idea. All right, and I'm all ears, man, let's figure out, you know, you go do the research or right, you're gonna be in charge of it since you came up with it, you know, whatever. Um, not all leaders are like that, but I, but I think most are open to, you know, data-driven decision analysis mm -hmm. that, that might be helpful. You just gotta be willing to do the work. Good morning, Gary. Uh, C. Matt Sarnike, also from the 367th Recruiting Squadron. I have to leave the email probably later. Uh, <laughs> but the question I have for you is that you've obviously made a leadership when you went from uh, being aggravated about not having a deck from a previous assignment. So, the tools that you've created and put into your toolbox of how to be a better leader, what leadership uh, moment did you have, and what actions did you take to become uh, better developed as a leader? And, Gain that uh, influence that you've had uh, as a chief master on that question. Yeah, so I think that that issue I was talking about earlier was like a shift, a, a big shift, bigger shift, you know, moment for me when I transitioned to being a lot more, having a lot more situational awareness about who I was. Um, that was right about the time that I started um, <laughs> dabbling into executive development and, and executive leadership. And that was probably it was a it was probably a few years later when I started I got some executive coaching and I had somebody basically expose myself to me on you know what I was good at and what I wasn't and what I needed to work on and, and what so I so I started paying a lot more attention and I took a lot more personal responsibility for you know who I was and versus who I wanted to be. And and then I started chipping away at, you know, I wanna be better at relationships. I want to be better at situational awareness. I want to be better at building teams. And, 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 and so I slowly started working on me. I stopped worrying about the world, the Air Force, the environment, and my supervisor, good supervisor, bad supervisor, don't make me any difference. This is what I can do to become a better leader for the people that, 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 I, that I particularly serve. And so that point, which is about somewhere between my 17 and 20 years in my career was a huge shift for me. I started investing in myself. I started reading a lot more. We didn't, you know, there was no podcast back, back then, at least not that I grew up. But I started reading a lot more and, and, and really trying to figure out, you know, how can I improve myself 
as as a as a leader. And then at some point, it transitioned to trying to instead of trying to be a better leader, I just started trying to be a better human being, which allowed me to be a better uh, a better leader. Because sometimes that's what that's that's all people need is they need you to be a better person, a better human being, to treat them with kindness and respect, and to listen and and invest in them as as people. And they don't care much about how much rank you obtain or how many leadership theories you can espouse. Because what they really care about is, man, this guy comes in here every day and walks by me and doesn't say a word, right? Or he comes in every day and asks me my wife's name for the seventeenth time. Like, dude, how many times I have to tell you, mom? You know, um, you know that that's the kind of stuff that that I, that I think matters. So, and it took for me to go through. This is a this is a maybe the shameful part for me. It took for me to go through the fear of not ever getting promoted again and not fulfilling my dream to realize like, oh, you gotta work on work on yourself. I would hope that it doesn't take that for all of you, you know, to to, to say, look in the mirror every day. How can I be a little bit better today as a human being than I was yesterday? Morning, Mr. K Ray. I'm Eric Paul from the Tenth Omar Squadron. Um, my question to you is given your time in the service. Sorry, this thing loud. I feel like everybody's looking at me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> given your time in the service and maybe some experience you've had with this in the past, what is your advice on toxic leadership, especially speaking on if you feel like you've jumped through all the hoops, um, use your chain of command to mitigate this situation? Oh man, this is a good last question. <laughs> Um, by the way, I think it's a good idea when you're talking to people, you don't have to pause as long as I do, but, and these, these are not, you know, pause for dramatic effect, but I learned a long time ago, if I'm asking people questions and they start talking as soon as I stop, then they probably haven't given it much, much thought. So typically what I'm doing is I'm just, you know, kind of organizing my thoughts, not, not delaying or just whatever. So it might be something good. This is very similar, I think, to the issue we were talking about with mental health because there is a bit of perception versus reality. I've worked for and I've been a tough leader. There's probably some of the leaders that I worked for that, that were considered tough that other people might have considered toxic. Because all of our perception is our own kind of kind of reality. And there's probably some people who might have might have considered me a toxic leader because I was so tough on them. <clears throat> so there is that aspect of, you know, how do you define toxic leadership exactly? You know, what what is it? What are what are we what are we talking about? But let's just suppose there there is you know, your reality is that this, my, my leadership, this person or the entire leadership structure is, is toxic. There's, there's a couple of things I think you have to do. One is you have to figure out, you know, what is my ability to change this situation? And in most of our cases, it's limited to not very, not very much. And so what I first have to do is decide what is going to be my survival mechanism? How am I going to you know, keep myself sane, maintain my well-being, you know, while I'm currently in this in this situation. And then what options do I have, right? One, can I take myself out of this situation? And, and in most cases, the, the, especially in the military, the, the, the likelihood is no. I can't just decide I'm gonna go work, you know, some somewhere else. Two, let me figure out, you know, what is, what issue about this leader, you know, like really irks me the most, it's causing me the most pain, it's causing me the most trouble, it's causing the most trouble for all, all of these people. And then my, my suggestion would be go to the person directly, right? And easier said than done, right? Most narcissistic, toxic people don't know 
or accept that they're that way and they don't really want to hear your advice or guidance or whatever. But it, but I think if you practice some of the stuff we talked about earlier, you know, ask questions versus you know making accusations. Now, I know some of you are probably saying, "Hey, man, I'm a just I'm a straight shooter. I just get right to it. I don't have time to be asking questions and beating around the bush and all this sort of stuff." Right? I was to that. I would say. You probably are pretty good at it. You probably go home and find ways to say to your spouse, maybe that dress is not appropriate. Uh, versus like, man, you got a big old butt when you put that dress on, right? <laughs> so you have a little bit of practice in uh, not being as direct as, as you want to be. And sometimes that's not always that. That's not how all, you always get results. So if you are the type of person that just says, "Hey, I'm a straight shooter," and people just have to like you, uh, good luck. Right, that's that's not kind of how how life works. Some people like that, some people don't. Some people respond to that, some people, some people don't. And so again, I think you have to figure out a way. You know what what is what is the common ground that I have with this person that will allow me to have a conversation with them where they, where they'll actually listen <clears throat> to what I what I have to say. It might take a day. It might take a week. It might take a a month, but if you're really in, invested and interested in trying to fix and make it better for everybody, you got to be willing to sacrifice, take the time and effort that it takes to build up trust and get, you know, this person, this toxic leader, to understand. Hey, this is the impact that you're having on this 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 unit, and and if we keep going down this road, this is ultimately, you know, how it's going to end. These are the things that we're going to miss. These, this is, you know, how it could have a negative impact on not only our unit but our sister units on the wing itself, or you know, whatever your your structure might be. And then I think you also have to get to a point where you say, you know what, all of this has been great. I've tried. I've given, you know, I've used all the tools that, you know, Kay Wright talked to me about, and you know, things are still not working. You know, here's my 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 next step, and that's reporting through whatever channels you think are the most appropriate. It might be uh, EO, it might be, um, um, what's the other one? IG. <laughs> I've been retired three years, man. I like it's been like four years. <laughs> you know, and sometimes that's, that's, that's what, it, what it takes. But there are probably other times when we, we can work out and figure out how to, how to make, make people better and get them to, to thinking more about their leadership styles and how it might impact other people. And then on the other end, sometimes we as leaders have to recognize when we have toxic leaders in our formation, we have to get rid of them. We can't make excuses for them. You know, we have to just say this, this is not what, you know, I had a, I had a toxic leader in my organization and, and I'm gonna be perfectly honest, it took me way too long to fire her. Even though, you know, there was, there was no OPM or none of this stuff. Like out here in the real world, man, when you get fired, that, you, your last day is that day. There's no, you go work over here at the wing building or you go over here while we figure this out or we PCS you to Scott and all this other stuff. Like as of nine o'clock, you're no longer employed here. You no longer have computer access. Your keys no longer work. You know, this is when your last paycheck will be. But, I, but it still took me probably too long to fire this person. Um, you know, for, for, for various reasons, right? Some of it, I didn't want to believe it, right? Because this is what happened with a lot of toxic leaders, and this is what happened with this person. With the people that she worked for, she was very toxic. She was very, like, bad. But she led up very, very well. Every engagement, every encounter I had with her, every time I saw her around her people, she was the nicest, she was the greatest, she was, right? So so a little bit of it was like, people are telling me this, but this is what I see, right? And how do I, how do I manage that? And then after the fifth person told me, I was like, all right, your key's no longer working. Mm -hmm. That's it, hey, let me just say thank you, uh, Colonel G, I appreciate it. It's good to see old friend, old teammate. Um, you guys have a great. Uh, those of you who are here at the tent have a great, uh, have a great boss. Um, but I, I appreciate you taking the time and the opportunity to come out, spend some time, time with me. Um, 
I don't miss a whole lot about the Air Force, just, just being honest, not, not in a negative way, but you know, I did my time. I was, I was in 32 years and I had a really good time. I did a lot of great things, had a lot of great assignments, a lot of great bosses, a lot of great colleagues, and, and mostly, you know, I still have them as friends and colleagues and, and whatnot. Um, but I don't miss, you know, dressing up like, like you guys or going to TDY or any of that, that stuff. Um, and enjoy life, man. There's, there's a lot more to life. Uh, what you do for the Air Force or Space Force is important, but there is life outside and beyond, you know, what, what you do for them. And there is an opportunity for you to enjoy life while you're in, um, and certainly an opportunity for you to enjoy life uh, when, you, when you get out. The sooner, the last piece of, you know, the last thing I'll give you to think about is, the sooner you start thinking about what your life looks like after the military, the better off you'll, you'll be. You know, start thinking now what what you what you what you want to do, because it'll allow you to be a little bit more intentional about what you do while you're in, right? If you want to be a high school football coach or something like that, uh, instead of going to get a master's degree or whatever, you should probably get your teaching certification. You should probably go to one of the local high schools here and start volunteering and start making connections and figuring out okay how how much this. This, this might work for me. I wasted a lot of time. I don't know if anybody's in PM and project management, but I wasted a lot of time with project management stuff because I, I hadn't figured out what I wanted to do in life. So I went and got all these project management certifications only to realize like, I don't even like project management. <laughs> I wasted all my Air Force cool money on project management. <laughs> then once I decided, all right, here's what I need to do with the executive leadership realm, but I don't have any money left. Was cool, so I got to pay for it myself. And, you, know, you get the picture. So you know, kind of decide as early as you can. I know it's not easy to nail down what you want to be. Um, you're gonna find yourself saying this. This is all I know. This is all my life. This is all I've ever done. Was the Air Force all my life? Yeah. So it's every other million people that serve in the Air Force before you, right? But it, so it won't be that hard to transition. It won't be as hard as you think. It won't be that hard to find opportunities. It won't be that hard to demilitarize um, you know, if yourself. So give yourself some time, give yourself some space. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Looking forward to tonight. <laughs>